And we are talking about the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, that we don't have to live uh, enslaved to our sin, enslaved to our past, or enslaved to the law, but we can experience freedom in Christ. And, and that's the message of Galatians. It's the message of freedom. And I'm enjoying going through this book of the Bible verse by verse together. And today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. And last week we talked about spiritual maturity. And uh, this week, we're going to look to the second half of Galatians 2, and we see a powerful exchange between Paul and Peter. And uh, I want to encourage you to keep your Bibles open today and ready. We're going to refer back to these verses often and uh, study this passage of Scripture together. If you are ready to dive in, would you say amen? We're going to start reading in verse number 11. The Bible says this. In Galatians chapter 2, verse number 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, this is Paul writing to the churches at Galatia. And he said, For certain, for before that, certain from uh, James came and he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. That means he was afraid of uh, those that were saying you had to adhere and obey the law to be saved. And the other Jews dissembled likewise. Everybody say likewise. With him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, who or why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. What a powerful verse. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the, the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you believe it today? I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let's have a word of prayer together today. Lord, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. And Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and to study your word. God, I pray that as we look to this passage that we would be able to be filled with your spirit, that we would uh, have an understanding of what this text means for us today and how it applies to our lives. God, I pray that we would learn to not live our lives in a way that sends mixed signals, uh, but that we live our lives with clarity, clarity surrounded by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said... How many of you have ever been in a play or some sort of performance? Can I see your hands participated in a play? I remember when I was in elementary school, I was cast to be in the Christmas play. And I was excited about that because I actually had some lines this particular play. Uh, normally, I was like extra number seven, you know, kind of off to the side. But this particular play, I had some lines. And the character that I was supposed to be portraying was um, an orphan boy who was very poor that didn't have a home for Christmas. And a very sad story. And at the end, uh, I, I found a home and it had a great ending, right? Uh, but the character that I was supposed to portray was this very poor orphan boy who was homeless and just really asking for money on the street. And so I was getting prepped and ready for uh, that play and that performance. And I told my mom, 
uh, I need to wear a jacket uh, as I'm in this play because this takes place in the harsh of winter and I need to make sure that I am uh, looking like I'm freezing and asking for money as this poor orphan boy. And so my mom went to the store to buy me a jacket, but she did not know that my character was supposed to be an orphan. And so my mom purchased me a brand new leather, shiny San Francisco 49ers jacket. And uh, she came back and she gave me that jacket and it was awesome. Uh, I love that jacket. The only problem is that jacket did not match who my character was supposed to be at all, right? And so everyone's wondering, like, is he supposed to be poor or not? Because that jacket looks pretty nice, right? And uh, I was sending definitely some mixed signals. And I think we ought to be careful in life that the character that we are portraying is in alignment with who we are called to be. So often we live our lives in a way that our character does not match our calling, And we can be one way when we're at church and uh, surrounded by God's people, but we're someone completely different when we are at work or at the gym. We can be one way when we're with our friends at small group, but someone completely different uh, when we are uh, out and about at work. And we have to recognize that God has called us to live a life of clarity and to point people to the gospel and not to send mixed messages and mixed signals. The Bible puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, everybody say an uncertain sound. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? As followers of Jesus, we are engaging in spiritual warfare, and we simply cannot afford to give off an uncertain sound, a mixed message. Do they care about Jesus? Do they love Jesus? They say they do, uh, but what they say does not match what they are doing in their lives. And so we have to make sure that our character is in alignment with our calling. 1 John 4, 20 says this. If a man say, I love God, and yet he hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And so it's not about just saying that we love God. It's about uh, demonstrating that in the way that we carry out our lives. Uh, Recently, I read the purpose statement for CVS Pharmacy. And I thought it was interesting. Their mission statement is this, helping people on their path to better health. How many of you would say that's a good mission statement? Helping people on their path to better health. Well, in 2014, the CEO of CVS Pharmacy, his name is Larry Merlo, he made headlines when he decided to completely remove cigarettes and tobacco products from their stores and uh, all 7,000 stores. And he came to this understanding and this realization. He said, we can't uh, say that we care about people's health, but sell a product that is detrimental to people's health. He said, hey, it's not about just making uh, money. It's about aligning with the mission that we have been given and the mission that we are trying to carry out. That was a decision that cost them billions of dollars. But he said, you know what? It's not about making a profit. It's about making sure that we are sticking to the mission. Can I tell you that as a church, our mission is to reach people with the life-giving and life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Hey, does our conduct align with that mission? Does the manner in which we live align with that mission to reach people with the life-giving and life-changing message of Jesus? We simply cannot afford to send mixed uh, signals. There ought to be some followers of Jesus today that would say, you know what? My calling is clear. Uh, My purpose is plain. I don't want to send the wrong message. I don't want to send a mixed signal. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am passionate about the gospel message. I love Jesus. I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this was the problem that was actually taking place in Antioch. And this is something that uh, Paul had to confront Peter about. They were sending some mixed signals. They were not sending a clear message. And Peter here in Galatians chapter 2 was struggling and kind of vacillating between two characters. And we see that the apostle Peter was living this Uh, duplicitous lifestyle, and Paul called him out on it. And there's kind of this awkward exchange in Galatians chapter 2. It's this powerful yet awkward exchange. How many of you have ever had an awkward exchange before? Can I see your hands? Kind of an awkward interaction. Galatians chapter 2, there's this awkward interaction, but in it, there are powerful principles that we can learn to make sure that we are living with clarity when it comes to our mission. Are you ready to dive into the text today? I want to give us five principles today that can help us live with a clear mission. Five principles. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. Number one is this. Courage paves the way for consistency. If you want to live a consistent life, 
and you want to uh, be the same in one environment and another environment and live with consistency, then you start with courage because courage will pave the way for consistency. I want you to see it in verse number 11. The Bible says this, but when Peter was come to Antioch, okay, and so this is where Paul and Barnabas were. This was the church that uh, uh, they were uh, uh, basing their mission out of, and Peter came to visit and withstood him face to face. He, he said, I withstood him to the face. He got up in his face. How many of you have ever had someone get in your face a little bit and you're like, you're in my bubble and you got a little bit uncomfortable, anybody like that? Uh, Paul said, I had to get in his face. But then he says this, because he was to be blamed. He was to be, he was in the wrong. How many of you would say that you are, that you would consider yourself to be a non-confrontational kind of person? I, I try to avoid confrontation. I don't like it when someone, you know, talks to me in the grocery store. Or I, I, I don't want confrontation. How many of you, that's you? Okay. How many of you would say I'm the opposite? I can tend to be a little bit confrontational. If I see something that I don't like, I'm probably going to say something about it. How many of you are like that? Okay. A lot of you didn't raise your hand. That means that you are non-confrontational. Okay. So you can go ahead and just put yourself in that category. And, uh, and so uh, what we see here is that uh, Paul was confronting Peter. He saw something uh, that uh, Peter was doing that was not right. And so he said, I've got to confront this. I've got to come and talk to Peter about this. By the way, that's what a good friend does. A good friend sees someone that's walking outside of the boundaries of God's will or drifting away from God's will, and they don't say, you know what, I'm just going to kind of let them discover it for themselves. A good friend says, no, I love you enough to say something. I love you enough to come and to tell you that what you're doing is outside of the boundaries of Scripture. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And this is exactly what we see Paul doing with Peter. He, he was provoking him to love and to good works, and he was correcting him in his error. Now, what was Peter doing that was so wrong? What was, what was the big issue that Paul said, I had to get up in his face. I had to come and confront him. And uh, he did it before everybody, the Bible says. And so what was the big deal? What was happening? Well, let's look at it in verse 12. Are you ready? ready. Here's what was happening. For before that, certain uh, brethren uh, came from James. Okay? And, and so uh, these, these uh, Judaizers is what they're called, those who adhere to the law. We'll talk about that in a moment. They came from James. And he did eat with the Gentiles. So Peter was eating with the Gentiles. This is something that God um, allowed him to do. This was something that God gave him the approval on. Uh, before, previously, according to the law, the Jews wouldn't mix with the Gentiles, and the Jews would not eat with the Gentiles. But Peter was eating with the Gentiles because God gave him the thumbs up. Is everybody tracking so far? So Peter was eating with the Gentiles. They were having a good time. Verse 12. But when they were come, those from James, he withdrew... And separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And so Peter withdrew from the Gentiles. Why? Because he was afraid of those that were of the circumcision. In other words, he was afraid of the Judaizers that said you had to obey the law in order to be saved. Peter was living by fear. Are you tracking with me? So, so here's kind of, let, let's paint the scene for a second. Uh, imagine uh, Peter's hanging out with the Gentiles, and they're in, they're in the food court in the first century in Antioch, okay? And so they're hanging out in the food court, and they're checking out the options, Sparrow and Panda Express, and they're kind of looking around. And Peter is having a great time eating with the Gentiles. They're having a great time eating bacon and sausage, sausage because God said, hey, you can do that. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do that now and partake. And so they're having a great time. Peter's hanging out with the Gentiles. But then into the food court walks the Judaizers. And they kind of walk in uh, with kind of their religious atmosphere, kind of their noses up in the air a little bit. And they walk into the food court and Peter sees them come in. And what Peter does when he sees those come in, uh, those Judaizers, what Peter does, he withdraws himself from the Gentiles. He says, I can't sit at your table anymore, sorry. And he goes and he eats over here with them at their table. I'm going to kind of sit at the popular table for a second. And so then uh, the Gentiles come over and they're like, hey, Peter, that was great the other day when we were hanging out. That was a lot of fun. We should do that again. And here's Peter. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you, what do you mean? I, I don't know. I don't know. And he's over here with this. And so then Paul walks into the food court and Paul walks into the food court and he sees the Gentiles over here by themselves. He sees Peter eating over here with the Judaizers and Paul says, hey, you're sending mixed signals. 
hey, you're sending the wrong message. You are inadvertently endorsing a false gospel because the Judaizers were promoting and endorsing a false gospel. And so Paul said, hey, you can't do that. You can't live in fear. And so Paul said, I got in his face. And so Paul was living with courage. Peter was not. By the way, before we're too hard on Peter, so often we do the same thing. We acquiesce to the opinions of others, and we know what we're supposed to do. We know the right path that we're supposed to take, but because we're afraid of what that crowd might think, we end up acquiescing to their feelings rather than following God's word. And so here is Peter living by the fear of men, lacking courage in his life, uh, saying, "Ah, I I want people to accept me. I want people to like me. I don't want to offend that group. And and, and man, Peter was kind of uh, torn between the two, living for the approval of man. Can I remind you today that the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Can I tell you that we don't have to live for the approval of man because we are accepted in the beloved. God has chosen us. He's called us. We are accepted in his sight. Now, we can know that. We can know that. But here's our problem. Here's our issue. The Bible says this in John 12, 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. What a tragic statement. When we are living for the compliment, we're living for the affirmation, we're living for the approval and longing, the approval of man, ignoring the fact that we are already accepted in the beloved. Rather than trying to live our lives in a way that would please him who has called us to be a soldier. It takes courage. Billy Graham said this, courage is contagious. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. And I want to encourage you today to determine that you are going to live your life with consistency. And if you want to live your life with consistency, then start with courage because courage will pave the way to consistency. And I don't know who needs to hear it today, But I want to encourage somebody to say, you know what? I'm going to stop living by fear. I'm going to stop living by anxiety. I'm going to stop living uh, to the surrender of my worry. I'm going to trust that God is in control. And I'm going to listen to what Joshua said when he he said, only be strong and courageous. I'm going to live my life with courage according to what God has called me to do. And so courage paves the way for consistency. Here's the second thought. Are you ready for number two today? Here's the second thought. Number two, where there is hypocrisy, there will always be collateral damage. Where there is hypocrisy, there will be collateral damage. Are you still with me? Notice verse 13. It says this. In the other Jews that were with Peter, they dissembled likewise. They followed in Peter's footsteps. See, he had influence. People followed what Peter did. He was a leader. Peter was a natural-born leader. He was outspoken, and he said, you know, I can't eat with the Gentiles at their table anymore. I've got to go eat over here uh, with the Judaizers. And what happened? The other Jews likewise followed Peter. But I want you to see the level at which this influence extended in verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much, even to the point, in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Uh, The the fact that Barnabas followed in Peter's footsteps. And Barnabas also said, I can't eat with the Gentiles anymore. I got to go eat with the Judaizers over here. And I've got to separate. And even Barnabas was sending mixed signals. What was the big deal about that? Barnabas was one of the men that helped start the church at Antioch. And so you can imagine Barnabas had relationships with those Gentiles. He led many of them to Christ. These were people that Barnabas knew and loved. Barnabas was the son of encouragement. He loved being around people. He loved these people. He gave his life to start this church. He was encouraging these people. But now he sees the hypocrisy of Peter saying, no, I can't be over here anymore. I've got to go be with the Judaizers. And what happens? Barnabas says, sorry, guys. And he walks over to be with the legalists and the Judaizers. Even Barnabas got carried away with the hypocrisy. Never underestimate the influence of your hypocrisy. Never underestimate what levels your hypocrisy can lead to and who is watching. See, we might think, well, it's no big deal if I kind of just am sending a little bit of a mixed signal. Uh, No, you never know who is watching and what decisions they might make because of the decisions that you make. Uh, The word hypocrite uh, means stage actor. And it actually was not always a negative term. 
In fact, uh, uh, back in the day, if you were going to be cast in and be in a play, uh, you if you got the role, they would say, congratulations, you're a hypocrite. Uh, you're a stage actor. And uh, that's exactly what it means to portray something that you are not. And this is exactly what Peter is doing in this passage. He's not living a life of sincerity. The Bible says this in Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve the things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere. Everybody say sincere. Sincere. Leave it in the chat today. Uh, Sincere. He says that you can be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. I love what that word sincere means. Uh, Literally, it carries the idea of without wax. Without wax. Say, what does that mean? Well, in the first century... In ancient culture, in the Roman Empire, uh, there would often be uh, idol makers and stone makers, and they would make these little idols out of marble. And uh, what they would do is they would have uh, these little idols out of marble, and you could go to the market, and you could buy these idols. Well, let's say you went to the market, and you bought this little uh, idol, and it was a dog, let's say, and you brought that dog home, and, and you accidentally dropped it, and the tail fell off the dog and broke off. Well, what you would do is you would take wax, and you would put that wax on the tail to fix that idol. Well, what was happening was a dishonest merchant would uh, take those broken stones, those broken idols, and they would sell them in the marketplace and not tell anyone that they were broken. They, they were just fixing them with wax, and they were trying to sell them. The only way that you could uh, tell uh, if they were authentic is if you would leave them in the sunlight, and the sunlight would melt the wax, and then they would fall apart. And so an honest merchant in ancient Roman Empire, uh, they would have a sign above those idols, above those stones that would literally say, sin, that means without, sin, Sarah, wax, without wax. What were they saying? These are genuine products. Uh, They are sincere. I wonder today, when your life is exposed by the light of God's word, is it without wax? Is it honest? Is it genuine? When God's word exposes uh, the little uh, nooks and crevices of your life, what is there to be seen? Uh, Are we living a life of sincerity? And this is what uh, Paul is challenging Peter. Hey, don't live this duplicitous lifestyle. Live with authenticity. Uh, Colossians 3, 5 says this, uh, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Hey, those that are without, that's lost people. They're watching your lifestyle. So walk in wisdom. Then it says this in verse number 14. It says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. So, so Paul says, again, I'm confronting Peter in front of everybody. He had courage. He says, When you are not walking uprightly. That's an interesting uh, phrase in the Greek. It's this uh, word, orthopodeo. Orthos means straight. Podeo has to do with uh, the foot, uh, kind of like we get our word orthopedics. And basically what Peter, what Paul is saying to Peter is, th- is this, you didn't walk with straight feet. In other words, here's the line that you're supposed to be walking and you're drifting from that line. You're not walking uprightly. You know the path that you're supposed to take, Peter. You know the truth of the gospel, but rather than walking that straight line on the gospel, you have drifted from that truth. You're not living a life of honesty and transparency. Peter, this is something that he came to learn. This is something that he came to recognize and knew what Paul was talking about because Peter wrote his own letter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, he was writing to suffering, the suffering church, and he said this, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Peter came to the place where he said, you know what? I learned the hard way that I can't live a duplicitous lifestyle. I can't live a hypocritical lifestyle. I must strive to live with sincerity and with honesty and authenticity and humility before God and before men. Never underestimate the influence of your hypocrisy. Here's the third principle today. Number three is this. Ignored revelation only leads to captivity. Ignored revelation only leads to captivity. Are you still with me this morning? Now, we're going to take a break here in Galatians chapter 2 for a moment because we're going to uh, understand the context of what's taking place here. And we're going to look to a verse in uh, the book of Acts here in just a moment. And the reason I think this is so important is because you might think, well, maybe Peter was just, he had a good heart and maybe Peter was just confused. Maybe Peter just didn't really know if he was supposed to eat with the Gentiles or the Jews. Maybe Peter was just kind of unsure about the whole thing and he's trying to please two crowds and maybe let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he didn't know. Well, I want you to know that's exactly what was not happening, okay? Uh, Peter Peter knew exactly what he was supposed to be doing because God told him what he was supposed to be doing. Now, uh, back in the book of Acts, one day Peter is taking a nap on a rooftop. 
By the way, how many of you think that sounds kind of nice? You know, taking a nap on a rooftop. Peter's up there just chilling, hanging out on the rooftop. And uh, he falls into this trance. He has this vision. And God is speaking to him in this uh, vision. And God was showing him that he was done with the uh, ceremonial uh, uh, eating laws of the Old Testament, the dietary laws. And he told Peter, uh, rise and uh, kill and eat. Peter, all those things that in the Old Testament says you weren't allowed to eat, you weren't allowed to partake of, I want you to know I'm done with that. And now you can eat those things. You can go ahead and partake. Now, this was so foreign to Peter that you know what Peter said to God? He said, not so, Lord. He's like, this can't be true. He's like, uh, I don't think so, uh, God. I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, partake in this food that's unclean. And you know how God responded to Peter? He says, don't you dare call unclean what I have deemed clean. And, and he tells Peter, you can go, you can rise and eat. And so you can have this new food and you can eat and, and partake with the Gentiles. Uh, the very next day, Peter uh, goes into the house of a Gentile named Cornelius. And uh, this would have never happened before. Peter was uh, barging into new territory because God uh, gave him permission to do so. And this is what he said after the Cornelius house experience in Acts 10, 28. He said, and he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one, uh, one of another nation. Okay, so he says, you know it's unlawful for a Jew to eat with a Gentile or to hang out and to kind of uh, mix company like that. But watch what he said. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So what did Peter say in the book of Acts? God told me that this was the route that I was supposed to take. God revealed it to me that I could eat this food and that I could eat with the Gentiles over here at that table. God gave me the permission slip. He gave me the thumbs up and said, you can do that. And so Peter knew exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He had the revelation from God, but he ignored it. And ignored revelation will always lead to captivity. I'm thankful today that we have the written, inspired, infallible word of God. This is God's word revealed to us. This is God's revelation to us. I'm thankful for the word of God. And so often we find ourselves in trouble because we have access to God's revelation, but we ignore it. I wonder what God has revealed to you. I wonder what God has called you to do that perhaps you have ignored. Maybe God is calling you to witness to a neighbor. Maybe he's been putting it on your heart to invite that friend to church, but you've been putting it off, ignoring it. Maybe God is calling you to step up and to serve in the local church and to be involved in the body of Christ. And I'm going to get on the dream team and I'm going to serve. I'm going to be a part. I don't, I don't want to just be a, a, a consumer. I want to be a contributor. Maybe God is calling you to serve, but you've been ignoring it. Maybe God is calling you uh, to take that next step and to start giving faithfully and to start tithing and trusting God with the resources that he has given you. And God has revealed that to you. And God has instructed you and is calling you to do that, but you've been ignoring it. And I want you to know that ignored revelation always leads to captivity. Peter knew what he was, God told him in the book of Acts, he knew what he was supposed to do, but he ignored it. It reminds me of uh, Jonah. Uh, remember, uh, uh, Jonah received some revelation from God in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He had the revelation from God, and what did he do? He ignored it. And where did he end up? In the belly of a whale. I would say captivity. <laughs> I want you to know today that ignored revelation always leads to captivity. And we've got to come to the place in life where we say, okay, this might be uncomfortable. This might stretch me a little bit, but this is what God has revealed to me. And so I'm going to follow through in obedience. Peter knew what he was supposed to be. He knew that Paul was right on when Paul was talking to him. This leads us to the fourth principle. Number four today is this. It's not about me. It's about Christ living in me. You still with me today? It's not about me. It's about Christ living in me. Notice verse 16. This verse is so encouraging and so powerful. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified. Now, when we read the word justified, we have to remember this word means to be declared righteous. Uh, it means to have a right standing before God. And uh, this is a wonderful term. At the moment you pray and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are justified. You are declared righteous. And Paul says this, a man is not justified by the works of the law. Do you believe that today? Uh, he says a man is not just, you cannot be saved by doing good works. 
It's not about the law. A man cannot be saved that way. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Do you see how Paul is hammering it home? He's uh, reiterating this. He's emphasizing this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And this is what the gospel message is all about. And if you are sitting in the room today, if you're watching online today, and you do not know that you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, then I would encourage you to underline verse 16, read verse 16, and believe verse 16, because we are not saved by our good works. We are saved by trusting in Jesus Christ alone. This is what uh, Paul is passionate about. This is what Paul is saying. And he's saying, he's saying, Peter, when you go and sit at that table, you're sending mixed messages. Now the Gentiles are wondering, do we have to become Jewish to be saved? Do we have to adhere to the law? Mixed signals. Uh, Paul says, hey, uh, you need to get back on track here. And, and so then in verse number 17, he says this, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He says, even though you're justified, you're declared righteous, you're still going to sin. How many of you have ever sinned since the day of your salvation? Anybody like that? Yeah, we're still going to do that from time to time, right? On a daily basis, we're still going to struggle with sin. And he says, does that make Christ an accomplice or the minister of sin? He says, of course not. Uh, God forbid, don't blame uh, God for your wrong decisions. And in verse number 18, he says this, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. This is on, on me. Uh, for all, I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now, here it is in verse number 20. Are you ready for it? This, this, verse number 20, I just want to let you know this is really great news for a follower of Jesus. And this is something that we can get excited about. This is really the purpose statement of our lives. This is what it's all about. Verse 20, it says this. I am crucified with Christ. Amen. Nevertheless, I live how can we live if we have been crucified? Aren't you thankful that Jesus rose again? And because Jesus rose again, he set that precedent for our resurrection so that we can rise again and experience new life in Christ. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. My old flesh is dead, but I um, am alive and well. He says, uh, nevertheless, I live. Uh, uh, not I, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says this. He says, it's not about me. It's about Christ living in me. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. It's not about me. It's not about my plans. It's not about my performance. It's not about what I can bring to the table. It's all about the grace of God. It's all about the love of God. It's all about his plan for me, his purpose for me. It's all about the blood that was shed on our behalf. He says, in the life that I now live, I don't live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. It's not about what I can do in my flesh. It's about walking by faith on a daily basis. And here Paul is exposing the real problem that was taking place in the churches at Galatia? Pride. What's so appetizing or appealing about the law? Typically, we don't like laws. We, we typically ignore them, right? Uh, driving down the, the, the freeway and we see uh, that speed limit, what do we want to do? We want to go just a little bit beyond the law, right? What is, what is appealing about the law? Well, when it comes to religion, the law makes us feel good about ourselves. The law says... I don't do that. I would never participate in that. Oh, you did that? Oh, I've never done that. I, uh, I would not do that. And, and uh, oh, I've memorized this many verses. And I go to church every single Sunday. I've never missed a Sunday in my entire life. And I do this and I do that. And it's all about I, I, I. What did Paul say? Yet not I. It's not about me. It's about Christ living in me. And when we understand that Christ is living in us, that is the motivation to live a life of godliness, to live a life of holiness. Hey, we can't just say uh, that we want to live in sin, that grace may abound. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We should want to live a holy lifestyle, and we should want to live a godly lifestyle, but not in our own strength, not in our own flesh, uh, not I, but by faith of the Son of God. This is what Paul is communicating. It's not, it's not about me. It's about Christ living in in me. Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to glory, if I'm going to be proud, if I'm going to boast about anything, it's going to be in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto 
the world. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He says, if good works could save you, if religion could save you, Christ didn't need to die. If you could go to church and participate in the sacraments and do uh, the catechism and you can do all the classes, you could do all the wonderful things and those things could save you, then Christ didn't need to die. But the reality is we all fall short of the glory of God. And even if we tried our absolute best to adhere to every single law that we possibly could, all 600 and some in the Old Testament, we would still fall short. We would never be able to attain perfection. And that's why Jesus came to live that perfect life and to die on the cross for our sins and to be the perfect spotless lamb of God without blemish and without spot. And he died in our place so that his righteousness could be placed on our account. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see the sin, he sees the holiness of his son living within us. Paul said, it's Christ that's living within me. Aren't you thankful that Christ lives within you today? We don't have to operate in our strength and our flesh. We can operate by faith in the Son of God that lives within us. And this leads us to our very last point today. And I want to give it to you briefly because I believe it's encouraging. Failure is inescapable, but recovery is always attainable. We're going to make mistakes. Failure is inescapable, but recovery is always attainable. Let's go back to the food court for a second. Imagine Peter being called out. Paul got in his face in front of everybody. Everyone stopped eating, put the forks down, looked over at Paul and Peter. Imagine being Peter in that moment. He knew Paul was right. He couldn't excuse himself. He couldn't say, well, Paul, no, I was doing this. And uh, and, uh, he couldn't justify himself. He knew Paul was right. I can't help but imagine that maybe Peter's mind went back to that night when he was standing around the fire and they said, aren't you one of those guys that was following Jesus? They said, no, that's not me. I can't help but think that Peter was reminded of his failure, of his mistake. And man, I denied Christ then and I was sending mixed signals then and now I'm doing it again, different circumstances, but same reasons, fear. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I care so much about what people think? Why why am I struggling so much? Why? Am I failing? And I thought about that and I thought so often we find ourselves in a similar place where why do I keep struggling with this same sin that I know is wrong, that I know I shouldn't do, but I keep on going back to it? Why do I keep on thinking these thoughts that I know aren't true, they're not biblical, but I keep on thinking them? Why do I keep on being unkind and unloving to the people in my life? I know that I'm supposed to be kind. I know that I'm supposed to be loving, but why do I keep struggling? Why do I keep falling? Why do I keep failing? This is Peter. I did it that night. I denied Christ, and now I'm doing it again, and Paul's calling me out in front of everyone. I'm a failure. Can I tell you that failure is not final? I love what Martin Luther said. It is of great comfort that the Bible records many celebrated people falling into huge sins. Such errors are given to us so that those who are troubled and desperate may find comfort, and those that are proud may be afraid. No man has ever fallen so grievously that he could not have stood up again. And no one has such a sure footing that he cannot fall. If Peter fell, I too may fall. But if he stood up again, so can I. Failure is inescapable. We're going to make mistakes, but I'm thankful that the grace of God is greater than all of our sin. And the grace of God is sufficient for every season of life. And we're going to fail, but by the grace of God, a just man gets up again and again and again. And seven times over, he keeps on getting up. And I want to encourage you, don't let the devil jump on your back and label you as a failure because failure is inescapable, but recovery is always attainable. We can get back on track. And Peter did. And I love that when Peter wrote 2 Peter 3.15, he said this, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Watch this. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Peter didn't get offended and say, don't you talk to me in public. Like, don't you ever embarrass me like that again in front of other people. Do that again, Paul. I'm never talking to you again. Peter said, Paul was right. He's our beloved 
brother. He got back on track and God used him to turn the world upside down. I'm thankful that the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You can try to outrun it, but God's mercy and love will chase you down and track you down. You can never outrun God. Running from God is a race that you will never win. His grace is sufficient. Failure, it's inescapable, but recovery is always attainable. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning.